And today, Jen is going to share with you her journey and USA, USAA's journey on how they've been standing up a true KM team. I'd like to turn it over to Jen. Thanks. Thank you. Um, well, welcome to our pre-lunch topic. I know you're probably chomping at the bit to get to lunch, but I promise to get you out on time. Um, so my name is Jennifer Jensen, as she said. I like to go by Jen, so if you run into me, just yell Jen, or else I won't know who you're talking to. Um, I do work as a lead DPO for our Enterprise Knowledge KM team. And uh, so my background is a little, a little shady, right? You, you don't have it in your program because I'm top secret. But I came from uh, a long time of owning my own business and doing a lot of consulting for other businesses. And so I had been doing KM for a long time, but didn't know that there was a true KM, you know, the word of the day, KM, right? So anyway, I am very passionate about it. And I do lead my team um, in the way that we execute is a lot of human-centered de design techniques. So I'll share that with you a little bit. And we'll kind of get into s sort of how our teams were stood up, the function of each of our different teams. Um, and I'll tell you a lot more about that. Uh, now that we know each other a little bit better, um, I would like to actually find out a little bit more about the people in the room. So how many of you work in the banking industry? Banking. banking. How many work in um, insurance industry? Any at all? Okay. All right. I'm trying to make sure I tailor my conversation. Um, how many work private sector, KM teams? All right. Government sector. Wow, lots. Okay, cool. So then you'll understand the covert part where I couldn't have you all sign NDAs, so I can't really show you exactly what our knowledge base looks like, and I apologize about that. So uh, how many of you have heard of USAA? Wow, that's awesome. <laughs> all right. How many of you have either served in the military or know someone who has served in the military, have family who have served in the military? Awesome. How many are USAA members? I've run into a few of you. Thank you for your membership. <laughs> awesome. Um, well, we were founded in 1922, and we are a member-owned organization. Uh, we support the military community and their families, and we provide many different services and products, banking, insurance, investments, retirement products, um, and we do give advice as well. We have 12.8 million members and counting. We employ over 34,000 employees globally. And so I'll tell you a little bit more about what we do here. In every meeting that we have, we start with our mission. And we don't share this externally a whole lot, so this is kind of special right now. <laughs> um, but this is our mission. And uh, it's no different. You know, being here, I want you to know, you know what's important to us and what our pillars are. That's kind of how we hold ourselves accountable to the mission. Um, that helps us stay focused and stay grounded. We also try to share a mission moment with every meeting. And so I'll share one with you. About seven years ago, there was a young woman who called into USAA to share that her father, who served in the Army, had passed away. It was a really difficult time, and USAA was there for her. Her mother was disabled, and she was an only child, so she felt a lot of pressure about taking care of all of her father's final finances and things. And it's a little bit emotional for me because that was me. <laughs> and USAA was so amazing and they were there for me. And I thought, oh my gosh, I wanna go work there. <laughs> and so here I am almost seven years later, so August will be my seven years. Um, and I couldn't be more impressed with the company, with the people who are inside of it, and especially my own team who couldn't be here. Um, so my partner in crime, Jay Bowling, who is uh, just amazing architect and experience owner, is speaking at another conference at exactly the same time. So you only get me today, I'm sorry, one half, but um, hopefully I can do it justice. Um, and so I wanted you to think a little bit about KM and how KM fits into what we do at USA. And so if anybody could maybe give me just a little snippet about how you think um, good KM fits into either the pillars or the mission, I'd love to hear your thoughts. I'll share one. Yeah. Head, head, sitting on the moment, 20-year-old daughters stranded in Florida, 
and the hotel was not going to honor the request. USAA comes to the rescue and it's done. And the KM of application that is, is that you don't have to reinvent the wheel with every situation. If there's a way to catalog those successes and how it gets off, whether it's contacts or how you fix it, mm -hmm. then again, that's KM. Yes, perfect. That's perfect example. So, I mean, in everything that we do, we use KM in order to solve problems every day. And so if we didn't have, you know, our knowledge repository and it wasn't working properly, so the search and findability of our, our knowledge base, um, our members wouldn't be able to be served by our representatives. They would not be able to do their jobs because it turns out that we work in a really highly regulated industry. So banking and insurance, right? And you're usually not having those two companies in the same company. And so, um, you know, that poses a lot of challenges. And so I'll talk a little bit about how compliance fits into this and why that's also, you know, something really important for us to look at. So what I'll be talking to you about today, and this is just a high level agenda, is about the former state of KM at USAA. Um, side note, we didn't really have a team. <laughs> so, um, and then the creation of a team of teams. Um, our project goals for search and findability specifically, because that was the first challenge that we decided to take on. Um, when and why to hire a vendor or you know, somebody to come in and help you with consulting. Um, insights and aha moments, there were quite a few. <laughs> and our project outcomes. And so, you know, this has been our project. It's large scale. It's been over a year and counting and still going. We're now moving into a sustainment function and also trying to derive um, some of the outcomes. And so I'll talk to you a little bit more about that. All right. So I'd like you to take that in for a minute. I know you've heard different things like 90% of the information in the world was produced in the last two years. And I know you feel this every day because your inboxes are full. I mean, I can barely manage my, all of my different inboxes. Um, and, you know, how do we deal with all of that information? When an enterprise grows, can you imagine, really, with regulatory rules and compliance, just how much more important being able to sort through and find that information becomes? And so um, we are custom now out in the world to these really amazing user experiences, right? And we expect the same when we go to work. And when you go to work and it's not the same as the way it works outside of work, you go like, what are they doing here? How could they not be as good as Google or Amazon, right? Um, so as I mentioned, you know, we're not only a bank, but also an insurance company. We have many different lines of business and different product offerings, and yet we don't have one centralized team, or didn't, um, that was the shepherd of our knowledge management function. It was left to the lines of business, the individual lines of business, very siloed um, to figure out. They were responsible for creating the content, properly tagging it, or improperly tagging it. <laughs> um, they, we had a publishing team that helped publish the documents, and any time that anything was needed for a legal reason, they would pull that document and get it you know, to the right person. Um, and they did have a front door for service requests in case something went down or wasn't showing up and things like that, but they weren't truly a knowledge management team. They were tied to our learning and development team, and none of them had any formal CAM training except for one, and so he was a knowledge manager and he was trying furiously um, to get the enterprise to understand how important uh, knowledge management would be to USAA moving forward in the, this digital um, age. And so this is a picture that we used at the very beginning to help our leadership understand just how important KEEM is. And it wasn't quite this bad, but you know, not only do we have frontline representatives, but we also have back office folks who support them in what they do, so in the delivery of our products and services. And so you can understand that we have many different users using this knowledge base that wasn't really working very well. Um, because in 2015, they had shifted from one type of software to another. And when they did that, if you're all familiar with this term, I hope they did a lift and shift. So basically, they took everything that was in and they dropped it into the new one, and nobody did any tuning or anything, and anytime new things came out, new products, there was no additional search terms added. So they had to find the ones that kind of fit the best, and um, it was a pretty exciting time. So 
uh, the creation of a team of teams. This is what we did when we came in. So one day I came to work and I was working on projects and programs that were enterprise wide. So anything that spread horizontally across the enterprise instead of in those silos, um, I would help with those programs and projects. And I uh, came to work one day and my boss said, hey, guess what? You have a new boss. And I was like, oh, that's exciting. I'm glad I still have a job. <laughs> Please don't take my badge. Um, and then she said, and uh, it's really exciting because you're going to a new team. And I was like, well, that does sound exciting. What is it? And she was like, it's knowledge management. And I said, well, what is that? Um, and so <laughs> my boss and I were the only two in the beginning um, who were helping to stand up this effort along with that publishing team. And so um, both of us um, had worked in program and project management for a long time, um, but we really didn't know much about knowledge management. So it was like, you know, what is it, baptism by fire and drinking from a fire hose? We did that. We um, took every class that we could, and, you know, we got our CKM, we tried to learn as much as we could. We brought the team along with us and had them all become certified knowledge managers. So it was an exciting journey, very fast paced. But we did determine after all of that work, we needed to stand up um, four different areas specifically. And you see those reflected here. Governance, I mean, I think search and findability is pretty, everybody get that one. So, okay, I can move on. <laughs> Governance helps with establishing our service level objectives. They also ensure that we adhere to compliance for review of articles. So we have a certain period of time that we have to review all of our articles and they make sure that our authors adhere to that. The next team is our knowledge management team. They have the governance of the article authors. So they help the authors create content. If they have questions, they create templates, they have an onboarding process, so that's what they do. Actually, do quite a lot more than that, but I'm just trying to give you very high level. And then we have our, um, uh, I'm sorry, administration team. They do all of our reporting and metrics because every different line of business has different metrics that they have to look at for their articles they have different reports that they have to have pulled and so we have that team stood up to help with that. But knowing all these things, we kind of took an inventory of the biggest pain points that we were hearing from our users and it was determined quite easily when we looked at all the messaging that was out there about, you know, different things that people would complain about, complaint is probably a strong word, but complain about um, on different repository sites. So we would have, um, we have one site where they can talk, it's called the Employee Job Satisfaction Tool. And there's, you know, banter on that. But 40 to 60% of the tools related dissatisfaction was around search and findability. I can't find what I need. I want to serve our members. How do I do that when I can't find the right article, when I have to do, you know, a memorized um, keyword search. And so what would happen is they would call into the senior helpline and the senior helpline knew exactly how to get to the article, but it was a memorized string of terms to get to the article, which teaches bad user behaviors. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. So we were stood up to run in a skilled agile construct. Does anybody, has anybody taken a test for skilled agile? Does anybody Know that? All right. <laughs> you know how hard that test is. So we all went and took it. Um, <laughs> and we do really run um, agile. I mean, it's, we are a business team. We're sister to our tools team, which actually works on the rep repository itself. Um, we do a lot of the search tuning ourselves. But um, we do all of those ceremonies that you would see, like daily stand-ups, which really help us stay on track. We do demos. Um, we do iteration planning, which is happening right now while I'm here. Um, we do reviews. We work in two-week sprints, and um, that keeps us accountable and also pushes the work faster so we can fail fast. Um, you know, we push out MVP all the time, so minimum viable product, and we do our program increment planning uh, every, every quarter. So uh, we do also work in a cross-matrix environment. The great thing is that we have a small but mighty team <laughs> of teams, but we can pull from other areas as well to use the knowledge that they have. I love this. How many of you work in cross matrix teams? Okay, that's awesome because your businesses are using, uh, 
I don't know how to explain it better than saying that you take the skills and you amplify them when you put them together, right? So it's like more than just the sum of the two parts, right? You get something better than you could have ever expected when you bring those diverse perspectives together. And so it's a very powerful way to work when we do that. And we don't have to permanently reassign anyone. We can just borrow them and then they can go back to their area. And now they have new knowledge that they can share with that area. So we do a lot of rotationals through this position, through these different positions as well. And rotationals are great. They um, usually come from the phones. So there are, are representatives that will come off of the phones for a little while, work in our team. And then when they go back, they understand a little bit more about search and findability, about knowledge management itself, about capturing knowledge. And so we find that that also brings a lot of value, it gives a lot of value to them and helps them then find other jobs, you know, that they might be um, more suited for now that they have this new knowledge. So it's pretty exciting the way that we work. Um, we did review the voice of the customer, as I said. We performed a ton of stakeholder interviews. And in that way, we were able to uncover those gaps that were deemed the highest risk. And when you say risk in an organization that is as risk adverse as USAA, you get a lot of attention. And so if you're wondering how do you get leadership on board when you're trying to stand up a KM team, well, that is certainly one way to do it. So what, here are the risks if we don't do this, right? Here's the risk if they can't find what they need in order to serve our members. And here's what our members will experience, right? It's really about them. And how will they experience this in, at the end, right? When they don't get the right information and we mislead them because we give them the wrong information. So we don't want that to happen. So our knowledge architecture evolution looks like this. I like to call this fix the broken things. <laughs> so that's the first thing that we work on, right? Is fixing the broken things, the foundation, the base language taxonomy, organized content, and smarter search. And so um, that began in late 2017. And although the formal project ended in two, at the end of 2018, um, we still continue to improve upon that foundation. We knew we had to focus our efforts here before we could do anything slick and fancy. So we didn't do special UI treatments or anything, you know, slick. <laughs> it's really bare bones. We just fixed the thing that and made it work, right? And so that we decided was the most important thing based on user feedback. So it was all based around what they said. We don't care if it looks like Google. We just want it to work like Google, right? And so we heard Google about 18,000 times. <laughs> and we tried to explain to them that actually what we were creating had to be better than Google. Because Google returns a ton of results, right? It wants to give you the most results so that you can find lots of evidence to support that argument that you're having with your friend about what movie is better than another. Or, um, and so what we want to return is that very one article that you need in order to serve that member in their time of need. And so we had to get this right in order to enable the future state of KM at USAA, which you see in those boxes to the right. This is the logical progression for us of steps that it will take. You want it to work fast and you want it to be intuitive. And so that the biggest bang for your buck is pushing those things up front because if you can fix that part, then you can work on all little details later, right? So if you can get the part to where they can get to the knowledge that they need in their moment of need first, then you can develop a lot more robust um, program after that. So we're going for world-class findability, all right? That's, that's the goal. Uh, and I like to call it findability nirvana, but you know, whatever you like, <laughs> so, all right. So these are the real um, problem and goal statements from our project. I wanted to share the real ones with you. And this is very rare. Again, we don't share a lot of inside information um, externally. However, um, coming up with a problem statement, has anybody ever had a challenge with coming up and agreeing on a problem statement with your teams? Yeah, right? It's, it's really hard. I can't tell you how long it took us to agree on this as a team. Um, but I can tell you that that problem statement came from words from our users. And they helped us craft the problem statement as well. So we involved them from the very beginning. Um, we asked ourselves why probably a million times. 
Um, I might be exaggerating just a little bit, um, but w my team is uh, fans of Simon Sinek, and so if you've heard any of his work, you'll understand kind of how we got there. Um, but we really wanted to get to the root of our problem so that we could ensure that we were working on the right things at the right time. And so the goals came much easier. Our employees also helped with that part. These are the things they told us that they wanted. Of course, not in these technical terms. <laughs> um, but there are some quick stats for you to understand. We have 34,000 users, as I said, spread out globally. And so we have distributed teams. We have um, my, my personal director works in um, Dallas. You know, I work remotely from Phoenix. We have a Phoenix campus, but I actually work from home. So we have people all over the place reaching into this knowledge repository. Uh, we have 13,000 and growing um, content records, which we call articles. We have hundreds of products, as I said. We have dozens of roles. We have five lines of business, plus that enterprise layer that kind of spans across the top. Our tool, we have six non-IT applications, uh, 30 plus feature sets, hundreds of features, thousands of options, 23 product manuals, 6,000 pages, and we are looking for one new common language. So that's a lot um, when you're coming new to a team to tackle. Um, so here we talk a little bit about familiar experience. You know, users, and I talk about users, external, internal, it doesn't matter who your user is, but their expectations are fluid. They expect the same experience anywhere they go, right? So I pick up my phone and I expect it to work like the interwebs. <laughs> and I look on the internet and at work and I want it to work like the one outside of work, right? And so we know that. They expect us to know them well. Um, they expect us to, does my work know me at least as well as Amazon does? Because Amazon recommends all these things and you don't recommend articles I need. So we were trying to kind of figure out a way that we could come together and make this happen for our employees. Um, you know, and our members expect the same thing and we do expect at some point that we'll open up some part of our knowledge base externally. We haven't decided exactly quite how to do that yet. And so we want it and our employees expect it to work the first time every time for it to be intuitive. And, and you know, why, why can't you know me as well as Amazon? Those, so these are things that stuck in our heads. And so here we talk about a little bit, why would you hire a vendor or, or when to hire a vendor? How do you know when it's appropriate to hire someone to help you? Like I said, in the early days of our team, we were small but mighty, and there is a gentleman in the back of the room here <laughs> who actually came in and helped our team understand a lot more about knowledge management as an organization, so organizational um, knowledge management, and how would we do that? So we realized that uh, it was time for us, really, to hire somebody with the expertise that we needed to get us over the hump, right? To get us started and get us on the right path and make sure that we're looking at the right things, as I said. I think the best time to hire a vendor, and I've done some external consulting as well before I came to USAA, is when you know that you have a project that has a true start and end date, right? Um, and you don't have the capacity to fill that spot and hiring somebody is very expensive, right? Because you're keeping that person, you're making a commitment long term, it's like marriage. Um, but you know, just having a vendor help out for that period of time, I think was one of the smartest things that we did because it didn't cost as much as we expected that it would and they brought so much value and actually we made some great friends out of it and we can call them anytime we have a question. And so um, we did partner with EK and we're so glad that we did <laughs> because um, they sure did help us a lot in all of the um, user research that we did. We were very well aligned with them. So we chose a company whose values were much like our own and they also uh, brought a different perspective. As I said, diverse perspectives are quite helpful. And they came in and helped us understand more about the landscape of our users and how we could improve the knowledge base in a way that would be helpful to them and how to do that, um, how to get from A to Z and how to make everyone happy in the meantime and how to make sure that our users' voices were heard is extremely important. 
And so we realized that we could go faster and further together. I mean, it's really, you know, when you bring in, like I said, even those cross-functional teams where you get this different perspective, you know, you, you create something bigger than the sum of the parts. And so um, we knew that we needed experts in that field because I was a program project manager and I was not an expert in KM at that time, though I feel like I'm getting there now. We performed countless stakeholder interviews, as I said, with EK. We had EK help us tell the story, right, because telling the story is a big part of getting everybody on board for KM. You have to create a culture that is accepting of the idea that I have to give up the power that I have when I'm the only one who knows what I'm doing. Because we have people who've been at USAA for longer than I've been alive, and you know, they're maybe the only person that knows this particular line of code or you know, whatever it is, and, they're, and it's very precious, right? And although we're a very giving company, very kind people, they're like, well, this is job security. If I, <laughs> if I know this one thing that no one else knows, and I, I found that that was probably one of the bigger challenges um, that we encountered. Um, but through earning their trust, and so doing all of these stakeholder interviews with our users, with executives, you know, we must have talked to hundreds of people early on in the very early days, that created a lot of trust, a ton of trust, because nobody had ever heard them before. Nobody took the time to listen to their problems. And so we found that they were quite willing to share those problems, so much so that um, I have folders and folders full of, <laughs> of all of their ideas. And they were excited. They were excited to be involved because we told them from the beginning that they would be involved. And so, I think that that is one way that we also were successful because we were able to get everybody on board with what we were trying to achieve. And so we explained to them how they would help us with the creation process. We essentially taught them the language of findability. So, you know, all those weird words like taxonomy and ontology and what those mean. Um, so that was exciting. So now we have tons of folks in the enterprise who can actually help us tweak and improve on our search and findability. All right, so you have to play to your strengths, right? And we jokingly call this Wagile. So I just told you that we run in an Agile construct, but there is a layer of program and project management involved because there are certain steps that have to happen before others. And so I don't want you to think that the entire thing was done just completely Agile and we just went crazy and we let our teams do whatever they wanted to do. No, we still had to have kind of that programmatic layer over it. And we wanted to get our project delivered on time, so we did have milestones. We thought that we would have a single pilot. It's kind of funny, um, you know, in these insights and aha moments, we thought, oh, we'll pilot it with, you know, this user group that's called the um, Member Service Representative Lab. And they are in there specifically to pilot all the different um, systems that we have and new, anytime we bring in any new software, they are the ones that pilot it. So they're very experienced at giving feedback and they know how to give constructive feedback so that we can fix the broken things and then try it again. So we thought we'd do a single pilot. And then we realized, well, this group is really good at giving feedback. They are very used to going through these things, right? But no one outside of that group has ever been experienced in giving any kind of feedback for a pilot. And we thought we didn't want to kind of taint the results, if you will, with just one pilot inside that user group that was very experienced. We thought, well, let's roll it out to parts of the enterprise as well so that we can see how they react to it. Because while the um, MSR lab is what we call it, we have lots of acronyms at USAA, and I apologize, even USAA is an acronym. Um, <laughs> so we would take it outside and we go to different teams, right? So not just focusing on just our insurance company, but also people in the bank and getting those different ideas. And then we would sit with them in y -cord, and so we would listen to their conversation that they were having with that member while they were using the new knowledge repository. So that was pretty exciting. And they gave generous feedback. I mean, tons of feedback. And we took all that feedback and incorporated it into our project. They, uh, we used our authors, we used our content owners and representatives to help us check and tag articles um, with the use of a custom design interface that was created by EK. And that was in order to train the computer, which used machine learning, to, to understand USAA's language because it is very unique. Everyone says that their company is unique, you know, 
when people come in and vendors who've worked with other companies come in, they're like, wow, you guys have your own language and it is not industry standard <laughs> at all. Um, and so, you know, we had to um, create this interface in order to make sure we tag the documents properly. Uh, what we learned from that is that auto tagging is not perfect. <laughs> there were some things that were really wacko when <laughs> they came out of that thing. It was like VA, which to us means veterans <laughs> administration, but to the auto tagger meant Virginia. And so <laughs> we had to go back and figure out a way. But the good thing is that um, through this project, we had backup plans upon backup plans. That's me, um, the project manager on this. The backup plans for backup plans for backup plans in case, and sometimes we had to fall back to that third backup plan. I will not lie to you. So another tip that I could give you is Think of all the things we brainstormed. What could possibly go wrong? What could possibly derail us from our goal? And how do we mitigate that risk? So if you keep a risk register, it's very helpful. <laughs> so we used a lot of project management tools in order to make sure that we were identifying those early on. And we had uh, generation sessions where we would have users generate terms. Um, we did this with the EK, so it was, you know, card sorting exercises and things like that. If you have questions about that, please speak with me after, find me at the conference, and I'll tell you all the user-centered design stuff you could ever want to know, because it's my favorite thing. Um, but we had them actually generate all of the terms. And we took those terms, and we found the commonalities, and then we had them sort those into buckets. And from those buckets, that's how we came up with our taxonomy, the structure. And then all of the words that they came up with was amazing. They found 600 missing search terms. So no wonder they couldn't find what they needed. Um, that's a lot of terms to, um, that were very specific for very specific articles that they were trying to find. And they weren't in the system to be able to be tagged to anything. So that was amazing that they found that. And so we had a lot of great collaboration with them, and they do continue to reach out to solve problems. We had them go back over the, the auto-tagged articles afterwards and help us find the, the broken things again. So fix the broken things is a theme here. Um, and they, they were so gracious in doing that. We had um, you know, leaders from all over the company saying, we'll give you the resources that you need to get this done. We know how important it is. These have to be tagged correctly. And so they helped us with that. But at the heart of any change is a good change management plan. So we did involve our change management partners to help us understand how we could explain to the business that while we were fixing this, it wouldn't be perfect when we rolled it out because they were expecting perfection. We're USAA, we do everything really well, right? And so they were expecting that same level of perfection in this. And search engine tuning is not, um, it's not the easiest thing to do, right? Because one group of users might think of things in one way, another group of users thinks of them. And even in the same um, line of business, they would call the same thing by another name. And so we had to make sure that we were all aligned and that they were becoming more aligned on the language that they used for their particular products and services. So, you know, I have to tell you that our users were just so excited that we were finally fixing it, that we were really surprised when we did roll it out at how understanding they were. They knew it wasn't perfect because we told them. And so when they found things wrong, they already knew how to tell us what to do because we had trained them and we told them, here's what you do when you encounter something weird like, you know, the VA thing, right? Um, and so they were very gracious in giving us feedback so that we could very quickly retune. And so we were prepared for that and we had a team stood up just specifically to work on that because we knew once we rolled it out, you know, that we were going to have some things to be fixed, right? <laughs> and so another thing that I wanted to talk to you about is a lo-fi neural network. That is what we did by having them generate all of those terms and having us understand the relationship between the terms. Um, they essentially did create a lo-fi neural network.
Can you see any relationship between the creation of a neural network? Can you understand that with search tuning and kind of how that works? Um, so ontology obviously, you know, has a lot to do with that, right? How do you relate those terms to one another and how do you provide a weight to that so that the term pops up, you know, or the article pops up higher in the search result? And so we were pretty excited about creating that with our users. That was probably one of the, my favorite parts of what we did. Um, so through a common vocabulary and utilizing our user inputs to organize content, we were able to create that lo-fi neural network and we designed a custom USAA NLP. Our new architecture enables a more intuitive um, browsing structure that's unique for each line of business. The structure itself is actually much flatter and so while I can't show it to you, I didn't give you all NDAs before we walked in here, um, I can tell you that you don't have to click into a folder, into a folder, into a folder. I like to call that like, you know, the little dolls um, it's stacked inside each other. And so you can't do that. Um, you, <laughs> you don't have to go through, you can just grab the medium doll. You don't have to, you know, open up every single one. And so they can quickly find what they need without having to dig deeply. And it looks a lot more like the Amazon experience. So we do have faceting and they helped us with the faceting as well, which is different than our browsing structure. Some people copy their browsing structure into their facets and we did not do that we made them unique and so it really is much more like an Amazon experience um, this is a diagram of how we view knowledge architecture we begin with concepts that are relevant to each line of business and then we classify that information in a hierarchy or type and then we look at the ontology of our taxonomy or how those concepts relate to one another we derive meaning from those relationships that inform the rules um, that are behind our intelligent search ontology and so you see the breakdown of how that works to the right. And again, if you have more questions about that, you'll have access to the slides. You can always reach out to me and I'm happy to help. So that's essentially our lo-fi neural network explained. And so we're still in the process, honestly, of determining our final outcomes because we just ended the project about three months ago. And generally it takes, you know, three months to start to see a change. Um, in the beginning, we were a little bit disheartened because our click-through rate actually went down pretty significantly. But what we realized is that our users still had bad behaviors. They were still trying to get to the articles the way that they were trained, which is that crazy workaround way, right? And so now we have a huge effort underway to teach our users to forget that behavior. We don't want to teach them how to search the search engine. You shouldn't have to do that. We want to teach them how to not search the bad way, right? <laughs> and so since this release, it looks, thinks, and feels like what the users expect because they created it. Um, our early numbers do indicate a pos positive trend. Our number of successful or percent of number of successful searches in the top five results, the rank is at 89%. Before the release, as I said, uh, we were at about 40 to 60 percent of users unhappy with search and complaining about search, and now that is virtually zero. For the last month, we had no complaints whatsoever about search. So that is pretty exciting stuff. Um, and so now I am reaching the end of my presentation. We've covered a great deal in our time together. I'm sure you're all starving, and so I will let you get to lunch. <laughs> I hope that that was clear and there were some actionable steps in there that you can take to improve your knowledge management teams and architecture. If you have any um, questions at all, I can take them now. We have a couple minutes. Sure. I'm not sure. I came in a little later. Did you already talk about the time span that was invested to get to where you are today? Yeah, so it was just over a year. So we started about a year and a half ago, and uh, it really took us a while to get that first part done of standing up our teams. And then once we did that, the project itself was about a year long. Sure. Anyone else? Sure. On your, on your first slide, you mentioned that you are a I am. That's a new job title that I've never heard of. So um, a skilled agilist is someone who understands how to release solutions at large scale, so for enterprise. And so there's a whole um, website you could go to, um, I think it's scaledagile.com, and there's lots of great information there about big scale release trains. So it has to do with, you know, how we 
how we work as teams. There's a lot of information there about how to run Scrum. Um, and then you have to take a certification to become a skilled agilist. Mm -hmm. Yes? So this is not a uh, credit union? No, it is not. It's, what do you call it? It's a, it's a member owned organization. Yeah, so the funny story, 12 Army officers had fancy cars when they came back, um, and nobody would insure them because they thought that they were too high risk. And so instead, they threw all their money on the table, and they decided to insure each other. And that's how it started. And then other Army officers wanted in, and so they let them in, and then eventually opened it up to other branches of service, but it was only for officers in the beginning. And in the last um, few years, actually, they opened it up to enlisted as well and um, other branches of service. So it's been a journey, and we're still looking at um, eligibility and how you know we might include other groups. Um, and so, are there other uh, similar organizations, your competitors serving the armed services staff, um, where you can like you know, share what you've learned with them to improve their services? Um, so there are some competitors that do serve only the military. Um, and we don't necessarily interface with them. <laughs> we do get competitive analysis, you know, of, of what's going on out there in the world so that we know how we can best serve our members. Um, there are some great banks and insurance companies out there. You know, USAA is just my favorite because it was my insurance company and bank before I came to work there. Um, I think it's a great organization because of how much emphasis they do put on the member and how much time we spent creating like user personas and um, user experience. So when I was worked as an experienced architect, it was you know those broad things that go across the whole enterprise and also um, individually. So we improved the auto experience. You know, my team brought design thinking to USAA. We brought Stanford D School in to teach us how to think differently. Um, I helped run a program called Think Differently. <laughs> um, so what actually was design thinking. And so um, we brought all these different programs in to get people to think differently about approaches to problem solving. And I find that that's been extremely valuable because the culture has shifted. And now we're looking at things in the way of what's the user journey? You know, what, where can we serve them in their moments of need and anticipate that before it happens? So. Anyone else? Okay. Well, I thank you all so much for um, showing up here to listen to me today. Um, and thank you for being such a great crowd. You guys are all so smart. And so <laughs> I'm very lucky to be in this room right now. Um, if you have any questions, please um, come and talk to me. I'm available to talk. And um, my email is right there. I'm on LinkedIn. So any method, smoke signals, whatever you would like to do to reach me, I'd be happy to talk to you. So thank you guys all so much.